Hello everybody. So, as you know, on this channel, one of the mega trends that I focus on is lifestyle brands, i.e. the replacement of, of older legacy brands that were built with the advent of television. This replacement by internet native brands and brands that are more audience specific and do not have as wide of a target but focus on a narrow segment and when i when i did my screening the stock market for anomaly videos i uh, searched growth stocks that traded at ridiculously low valuations and that still had growth and love sack came up and love sack is con is predicted to have 30 percent growth over the next 12 months yet they trade at a a price to sales ratio of 0 0.6 and and the p they have a p ratio of 12. Um, so this is a company that is dirt cheap right now and, and it's clearly been sold off by the market uh, like any 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 company that was innovative and that was you know bid up in the 2021 phase I think the stock is down something like 70 um, percent from its peak maybe maybe even more but anyways uh, the, the, the point here that I'm trying to make is, is for uh, the, these mega trends um, is that the, the, the lifestyle mega trend is, is something that I've observed many times, right? And you have you have you have companies like Lululemon or Figs, for example, who are targeting a narrower segment of a population, and they're competing against older uh, clothing brands like the Gap or Apartment Nine, right? The the newer brands tend to tend tends to try to be more meaningful to the modern consumer than the older brand. And that's kind of how you see this shifts from an old brand to a new brand. The same is true for, for example, Celsius Beverages uh, is a company that I covered on the channel before. Celsius uh, is competing at to head against more more legacy energy drinks like Mountain Dew. And uh, what you see is that Celsius is growing at, at mind-boggling numbers, almost 100% a year growth, uh, while older brands are stagnating because these new brands were not built with television. These new brands were built with a specific targeting in mind, with a narrower segment of consumers that are therefore more likely to buy because you design a brand that is better suited to the needs of a narrower segment of a consumer. And uh, Love Sack, I believe, is kind of what it's doing, but in the in the in the furniture mar furniture market. So let me let me begin with, an ana with my analysis of Love, Love Sack here. So, um, in in the same vein as you as you as you have um, new new clothing brand, new beverage brand versus old clothing brand, old beverage brand, are you gonna have new kind of? rest couch slash chair brands competing against the the absolute legacy brands which is things like like recliners and sectionals and so let me just go through this example if you if you live in the US you, you've most likely heard of, of lazy boy uh, hard, hard to find a, a a grandparent or a parent that does not have a lazy boy uh, recliner or or some, something in this in, in in the same same vein right they, they have a few competitors but you could buy a a knockoff recliner, um, but you know. So if they have things like "Live Life Comfortably," is the motto of Lazy Boy, um, and, and, and you know, it, it's a it's a type of product that, that that caters to you know the the end of the work day. You're tired. You're lazy. It's it's Sunday. You know that 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 type of product caters to that need for rest, right? The the basic um, human need for for rest. Um, and you can see these are expensive products, right? If, if, you, if you look at the, the, the legacy player, the, the recliner, while well, it's on sale, uh, I don't know if it's a good sign or not, but uh, it, it was a $1,500 $1, product, um, these, these recliners. So, so, they, so they, are, they are not cheap. Uh, and one of the questions that I'll ask is, do Gen Z slash millennials slash Gen X, uh, will they prefer to kill productivity in bin bags? Are, are bin bags... Um, a better suited. Uh, do they do bin bags resonate more with the modern day consumer than recliners? And, and, and I think one of the key lenses to analyze that and answer that question is to discuss the, the changing role of, of television. Recliners were clearly invented for for television, right? For for watching television comfortably. Today. Television is not as central in our lives. Like less less than fifty percent of Americans have TVs. Um, Americans are, are, are more often on, on their phone, on social media, on TikTok. Even if they watch shows, they will often watch them on their phone. And so you have to ask yourself: Is something um, you know 
seemingly as silly as a bin bag is that is that better uh is that better to i don't know scroll on tiktok or something is that better than um than a recliner and 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 i think the answer is yes at least if the sales growth of love sack is to be believed compared to the sales growth of more legacy furniture company and furniture brands um it's it's noteworthy that they are they are about the same price for for that that I'm gonna call them both recliners, but that modern recliner and an old old recliner, they are about the same price. With the old, old product being 1500 and the new one being being 1550. Of course, the the trendy new product has no sell. Of course, uh, and so 1500 dollars that's that's expensive. And when when it seems very expensive when you look at this, which is a a, a bag, right? It's a, it's it's a it's a bag with a cushion in it. Um, and and one of the question is which which is more profitable, um, do you think, right? And and and, um, and you know one of them is fifty two percent, one of them is forty one percent. Take a second to guess, and you probably guessed it. The bean bag is much more profitable with a fifty two percent gross margin compared to the leg- legacy furniture um, uh, store. Um, this is Lazy Boy's gross margin. Lazy Boy's has forty one percent gross margin, so much more profitable. But but keep in mind, you're also going to have uh, lo- lower opex and capex from the fact that these ship vacuumed wrapped and that's a major distinction between shipping this and shipping this so uh, so love sack i believe is, is going to be a more profitable company like a lot of modern day business models um, now their other product is what they call the sack channel it's a play on word on their first product which was the bean bag um, which we're, we're clearly clearly in the chair business, and so the, the sectional is is building on the, this this form factor, which would fit in three different boxes. And so with this form factor, you can make thousands of different couches and 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 and, and furniture for your living room. And so this is just an example of a few things you can do. But you can also turn turn it into into a temporary bed. You can also turn it into I don't know what that is, but that's that's some sort of a of a, of a giant, um, I don't know, a giant couch like a giant recliner, and you and you could do something much bigger than that if you wanted to, or much smaller, right? You can really reconfigure it however you like, and that is a, a selling point, I believe. That is a differentiation point. Now, keep in mind, they probably did that because of shipping. Think about how much easier it is to ship a, a, a seat or, or a, you know, or a, 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 a style of sectional that, that fits into these tiny boxes, right? You, you can ramp your manufacturing. You can scale much faster because everything has the same sa- same form factor and it's also cheaper to ship because it just fits in these tiny boxes. But there's also other benefits. For example, it's entirely changeable. You can you can you can uh, change the cover and replace it for a new cover for a new style or if it's dirty or anything like that um, you can wash the covers uh, you can move it easily right if you if you're say a millennial you, you change you change your apartment once a year imagine moving 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 that up and down the stairs compared to moving a, a traditional sectional right it's not even funny one you one one you need a moving company and and and, and you know, kind of strong people to help you move these giant sectionals, and another one you can just move it on your own, put it back into into the box, and and just just move these different compartments. It's rearrangeable. It's 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 uh, it's upgradable. It can follow you your whole life. Um, so so there is there is there is advantages to to the model. They are also an omni-channel business in in which which they they do have stores, but it's it's omni-channel. So you can go to the store, see it in the store, and buy it online. Um, you know, you 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 have less less of that pushy salesman business which which is still much of a furniture business is, is you, you still go in and, and you have a, a, a pushy salesperson that follows you everywhere you go um, you know it's kind of the same as, as, as dealerships in, in in a way well this is also also changing people people like to buy uh, on their own terms um, and people like to be engaged right they, they like they like to love the product before they buy and so I, I think this company fits into the, the the current trends and and, and where um, where business is headed and, and is selling a product in in the modern way to to sell a product uh, which is you know asset light just good design 
and a product that is that is going to be reconfigurable, reusable, etc. Right. The, the whole idea is that you know how many times you drive around a neighborhood and you see couches on the curb. Well, with that type of setup, the, the, the couch on the curb uh, um, idea is gone because you can always reconfigure it into whatever you need. So let me now move on to the financials. So the financials, you know, that's kind of what matters, uh, uh, um, obviously, in any investment. But uh, now, that, now that I've, uh, I've made quite a, quite kind of a qualitative case as to why this business makes sense from a qualitative standpoint, I think it's important to note that sales don't lie. And in the case of Love Sacks, um, sales have been very good. Um, actually, they are showing 41% compound uh, annual growth rate on their sales. And, and you can see, and this is a, a, the, the estimate, by the way, this is the forward estimate of 630 million. But you can see they move from 166 million in 2019 to 233 2020, 321 in 2021. Um, let's call it 500 in 2022. And now maybe 6, 630 in 2023. At a time when when the furniture market has declined in, in their investor presentation, they are showing the, the furniture market declining 17% while they're growing at, at uh, you know, uh, just a tad more than 40%. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Analysts expect 30% in next 12 months revenue growth. And, and, and keep in mind, that's, that's knowing the, the whole housing recession that we're in and, and less people buying homes. So, you know, this is obviously a business that's, that's heavily impacted by people buying homes like, like all furniture. But despite that they are still showing showing growth. They are still showing thirty percent revenue growth. So um, the growth the growth to me is like is like a you know a B plus A minus when I see these numbers are for growth. It's really good. Um, what about competition? Well. Um, they, they, they have traditional furniture makers as their, as their competition, although it looks like they, they've carved the blue ocean for themselves, right? It, look, it looks like the, the, the product is differentiated enough to claim that it is in a league of, of its own. Um, in, in my view, what, what I see as the, the bigger competition is, is the cheap Amazon knockoffs. And so if you go on Amazon, you can see a bunch of bean bags, and you know they'll be a few hundred bucks cheaper, but you don't know, you don't know what quality you're getting. In a market, you're always going to have people who go for the high end, and you're always going to have people who go for the cheapest product. And it depends if it's a product you care about or not. But when I look at 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 how well they're doing. Um, you know, I, I see that their store is very profitable in number of sales per square foot compared to the competition. Uh, if you compare, say, say, for example, to a very high-end furniture store in the U.S., our house, if, you're, if you've heard of it, very high-end, you can see that their sales per square foot are, are very, very, very tiny. Um, and if you've ever seen a, a love sack showroom, I'm going to call it a showroom, um, in a... Um, in the U.S., they typically have some of the smallest footprint, right? It's just a teeny tiny storefront. So it's cheaper. They can expand that way by, by picking up small retail locations, small retail stores, um, and, and having kind of amazing sales. So the pay, payback period for investment in their stores is, is under one year which is stunning. They're also um, selling selling more in, in different avenues. They, they, of course, sell online, but a lot of their online sales are, are repeat buys. Like if you want to expand your product, you would buy online. But what they, what they sell in person too is in the form of what they call the shop in shop. Uh, setup. So, for example, they are going to have a booth at Costco, and you can buy it at Costco. So, the whole shopping shop uh, uh, structure is also an important way for them to grow, and they intend to keep growing and keep their exposure and in, invest heavily in marketing. Macro sensitivity, I put it as a medium here because you know uh, the, the housing market is still impacted, so they're going to be impacted by the housing market. And I think I think from their the recurring revenue, um, it's not the most recurring business, but I've, I think it's important to see that they have a little bit of, of recurringness to, to their revenue, because um, once someone uh, buys the product, right, once someone buys the product, there will be a time likely where they will have to expand the product. And so who knows if it's 10 years from now, 15 years from now, two years from now, there will be a time where they have to, to expand the product. Also noteworthy is that they, they, they market this product heavily towards families and, and um, 
um, you know, they, they, they explain how children really mess up couches and like, like you know, spill whatever on the couch, etc. And so they, they, they explain how because the, the cover of the couch is, is changeable so many times, you can have recurring families who just buy, buy new fabric for that couch and just replace it um, as it gets damaged. So they have a lot of repeat buys and repeat sales. They're also very proud of their word of mouth and their customers' numbers. And I've checked some of that. Like, I've done some, some research with some reviews online. They are they have a very strong online presence. And so if you look sectional, look up sectional on YouTube, and you'll see a lot, a lot, a lot of reviews. And, and these reviews have hundreds of thousands of views of people who explain whether they like the product, why they like it, why they don't like it sometimes. Anyway, it's kind of a, a modern open brand you know who who what it is who it's for who it's not for etc uh, what about the growth runway the growth runway is 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 i believe tre tremendously high so so they don't claim to be part of a full furniture market um <clears throat> which 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 uh, which I think is nice of them uh, uh, to tell us that right. So they're, they're being fair in their analysis. They're they're in the seating seating market, um, and they estimate that they have about one percent of the seat and chair market. So that's that's pretty impressive if you if you ask me. Um, and they estimate that they can grow that quite a bit. Okay. Now what about growth by acquisition? There is none. And what about SGN as a share of revenue? Well, it's been consistently at under 50% and it's mostly the marketing um, expense from, from what I can see, although you're going to have a lot of general expense uh, um, related to the opening of these new stores. But so, so you know, building a new store that's expensive, one for stores where it's, it's less expensive, they are investing in marketing to gain that, um, you know, that, that, that distribution system, to get that store network, which will pay off in the, in the long run. I don't have a problem with a company uh, investing heavily in marketing when they're growing this fast. At this stage, to me, uh, the marketing is an investment spend, right? Especially when you take into account that there is a, a large recurring component to the business and there's also a word of mouth component, if, even though it's always tough to confirm whether it's true or not, right? If you're not a buyer of a product, you can't know. Um, um, but anyways, let me move on to the rest of the analysis. Any near-term financial bankruptcy? Well, this, is, this may explain the valuation. Right here. This is where where it's bad. And in my, my first video um, on 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 Love Stack, uh, Love, Love Stack, I pointed this out a little bit. Is uh, they only have 3.8 million left on the balance sheet, and their last free cash flow uh, quarter was negative 13 million. Now, there's a few things to say. First of all, they have a line of credit that they that is unused at Wells Fargo. They have a 40 million line of credit with Wells Fargo that is unused, so they are not going to go bankrupt. Uh, number one. Number two, they have a lot of merchandise, so they are clearly. And, and remember what I told you about about merchandise. It's 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 uh, it's it, it's merchandise that will be sold because 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 the customer buys just that one merchandise. It's not like they're a clothing company and they made a uh, I don't know like a like a dress or something and that dress people up not to like it and they're going to have to destroy it. It's a little different when you're a company like, like Lovesack with, with the products that can reconfigure in so many different setups, right? I believe that inventory will be sold um, at the price, right? At the price of the business because because the, the inventory itself does not go out, go out of style. The, the inventory is a, is a building block, right? It's this building blocks for the couch. That's the inventory. Um, so so I believe that's, that's, a, that's something going for them. Another thing going for them is the seasonality of the cash flow. And I think that's going to be the most important thing to look at tomorrow when they announce Q4 is what's the cash flow um, and is it going to be positive? Because when I go back to their cash flow and I look, they typically have an outstanding Q4, like plus 40, plus 50 million in Q4. And they spend the rest of the year drawing in that inventory to operate at, at a flat free cash flow. So what's going to be the free cash flow? Is the free cash flow in Q4 going to be 40, 50 million? In that case, green flag in my view, or is it going to be perhaps negative? And if it's negative, that would be a definite red flag. And so we'll 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 know we'll know that tomorrow. What about the gross margin? Gross profit margin is fifty-two percent. It's 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 excellent in that space, in my view. It's higher than the the established high-end player in the chair space, which in my view in the U.S. is lazy boys, and and it's you know it's 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 a good chunk higher at fifty-two and a half percent versus forty-one percent. Then they do have some debt, and what can I say? I'm not a fan. 
I don't I, I don't like it. But this is this this punishes them in my model because my model I use enterprise value, and of course if you have debt, that's going to increase your enterprise uh, your enterprise value, and that's going to penalize you in the numbers. Not a fan of the debt. Um, they I would I would much rather see uh, see less debt, or because this is you know this 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 is a company um, with a three hundred million dollar market cap, so that's high debt. Anyways, dilution dilution is excellent. They it's been essentially flat, and they've actually even even reduced some, a little bit of a dilution. The company is founder led. Five uh, percent is a little light, but that's that's still okay. Like that's that's better than none. Um, the company is founder led, and okay, yeah, I, I I guess this is an orange flag a, a little bit, but it's 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 okay. It's still pretty good. Revenue per employee is excellent at a million per employee. It's absolutely excellent. Absolutely love that. And let me conclude. So let me let me finish with this conclusion. So so I, I, as as I as I usually do. I like to compare it in my in my spreadsheet compared to all of the other stocks in the spreadsheet. So I compare them to to the lifestyle stock here, and, and when I look at Lovesack, uh, I see that they are as cheap as Stoneco. Uh, if you if you follow my channel, you know I find Stoneco very cheap. They are they're cheap. They're cheaper than Hims uh, on a gr- on a growth basis, and, and so you're paying enterprise value over trailing twelve month gross profit is a two. And over forward gross profit is 1.29, um, and we are still uh, still having 30% revenue growth in the next 12 months, 52% gross margin. So excellent, excellent, excellent numbers. Uh, they are definitely the cheapest lifestyle stock in my universe. Cheaper than figs, and and of course much cheaper than Celsius because Celsius Celsius is so expensive. So let me finish with my, my commentary on that stock. The stock is dirt cheap, and it still has 30% growth going forward. The valuation is is a uh, is when I say unreasonable, I mean it's crazy. Like the, the, the valuation is is uh, the, the market's insane. This is a company to me um, that should be that should be trading higher than that, in my view. It's a, it's a zero point six price to sales or zero point four six forward price to sales. So dirt dirt cheap for a company with this, this type of margin and this type of growth. And what am I doing right now? I'm not doing anything right now. I'm waiting for tomorrow because tomorrow we have earnings and the market is very fickle. Um, you know, a company can miss consensus by one penny, and the stock could drop twenty percent. Uh, so the market is the market is very very fickle. So I am I am not doing anything on the stock. I am I am waiting to see uh, the quarter tomorrow, and and if it's any good, I'll probably make an update on the channel and and tell you where I'm buying or not, or whether I'm doing nothing or whether it's a too hard. But for now, it's definitely an interesting company. Tomorrow, I want to see them guide really nice guidance going forward, and uh, I also would love to see um, to see that, that that cash flow becoming positive again, and see that they had a a great holiday uh, quarter, right? A great great sales o- over over the holidays, which is the period they're reporting a- about. So, anyways, this this was it for this video. This is not investment advice, just entertainment. Always entertainment. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all of your likes, your subscribes, and all of your support. Thank you and have a great day.